with us two weeks. Oh, oh, by the way, I do want to say thank you to Ben for speaking last Wednesday night. Appreciate that so much. Thank you for the opportunity. We were scheduled to, to go somewhere. We had reservation and all that. But the closer it got, I just chickened out and I canceled it. And they said they'd let us reschedule maybe in the spring. But I, I said, where we were going to go, I said, that's where a horde of senior adults are going to be. Gatlinburg, Pigeon Forge. And I said, you know, I don't think I've got to go. <laughs> I said, Sophie, do you mind? She didn't mind. So what we did, we went out to eat every night. That's basically what we did. That was our vacation anyway. All right. But anyway, thank you, Ben. Appreciate that. Of course, appreciate Pastor Robert um, taking the service this Sunday entirely. But two weeks ago, someone remember what our lesson was on or who it was, the, the main character of the lesson was? Stephen. Stephen. And uh, we spoke of Stephen using the words of Jesus in one of the letters in Revelations to the church of Smyrna to be faithful unto death. And that in Acts 1.8, when Jesus said, you shall be my witnesses, the word there for witness is the word for which we get our word martyr. You will bear witness of me unto death. And of course, Stephen did that. I thought we'd take just a few Wednesdays to talk about some of these people in the Bible who were faithful unto death. And tonight is one of my favorite characters in the Bible. I've, I've got a number, but this guy, he really is at the top, along with uh, one in the Old Testament. But John the Baptist, uh, the best I could find is believed that John the Baptist's ministry lasted maybe six years. And if you know anything about this guy, not only was there the brevity of his ministry, but the intensity of it. This guy, he was under pressure almost from the get-go. And, of course, he will lay his life down. Stephen was stoned. John the Baptist was beheaded. A horrible, gruesome death. But all because he remained faithful. I don't know what John the Baptist might think one day if somebody makes it to heaven and walks up to him and says, you know, I preached God wants you to be healthy, wealthy, and happy. John might say, may I tell you my story? See, but he was faithful and it cost him his life. Now, I want to read first of all from Matthew 11. We've got a lot of scripture. We're not going to be able to read all the scripture, obviously, because I trust you're familiar with this guy. He's a very colorful character, right? If you, if you remember uh, in Luke, his mother Elizabeth is visited by Mary and their kin, okay? And the Bible tells us that when Mary entered the house and there was verbal connection, the Bible says that the baby, John the Baptist, leaped in his mother's womb. So he apparently, he really was a character, you know? And, and he, God, I believe God, I shouldn't say God needed, that wouldn't be right. God never needs anything. But I believe that God organized that for this particular role, he would use somebody who was not lame and tame, milk toast, you know? But somebody would have some grit and a strong personality about it. So that's interesting that that is said. Now, I know you, you dear mothers, and I remember what, so, you know, the, how in the womb, the baby will kick and all that. But the Bible says he basically did a somersault. <laughs> so he was really, apparently, a character from the very get-go. But here in Matthew 11, you know, at the end of it all, what's going to matter for you, for me, anyone else, is what does Jesus think? What does Jesus have to say about it? You see, because you know we're all heading toward judgment, all of us. We know the unsaved are heading toward the great white throne judgment, horrible event that will be. But Christians are heading toward a judgment. It's called the judgment seat of Christ, and our works will be tested. But you know the Bible talks about how the Lord will greet. Those of his who have been faithful with what? Well done, uh, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your Lord. 
Well, Matthew 11, we have a little commentary made by Jesus. Let's, let's go ahead and read that. Matthew, Matthew 11, verse 1. Now it came to pass when Jesus finished commanding his 12 disciples that he departed from there to teach and to preach in their cities. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples. So apparently John was allowed to have visitation. He's in prison and he's going to die there. But he's allowed to have some contact. So he sends two of his disciples and said to him, that is speaking to Jesus, are you the coming one? That's the Messiah. Or do we look for another? <gasps> Did John have a little lapse here? Did John have a moment of weakness? Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you have heard, or which you hear and see. The blind see and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. <coughs> and they departed. Jesus began to say to the multitude concerning John, What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. Now, the second half of the verse makes it a difficult verse. But he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. But ever how that influences the verse, it does not take away from the first half. That Jesus says of all the prophets born in Israel, John the Baptist is the greatest. And from that day of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. So he is the like the capstone, he is the conclusion of Old Testament prophets. And if you're willing to receive it, he is Elijah who is to come. And that's told over in Malachi, that Elijah will come. The spirit of Elijah was realized in John. He who hears, he, he, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. But to what shall I liken this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to their companions and saying, we played the flute for you, you did not dance. We mourned for you, and you did not lament. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a wine-bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, but wisdom is justified by her children. So the Lord here makes a, a connection and identification with John, and he gives his stamp of approval. He said, whatever you might think of John, this is what I say. And when you go over to Revelations, it is said of Jesus that he is Alpha, the first, and the last. He has the last word. <laughs> Anything else is but dribble. It does not matter. He has the last word. And so John's in prison. He's going to be put to death. So let's just kind of work through this right quickly this evening. And just, I, I know this is very much something familiar to you, but just let us relish this. But more than that, may it challenge us this evening and convict us a little bit. Because you see, if you think you're having a hard day, you might want to visit John, all right? You just might want to sit down and say, John, I, let me tell you how my day's been. John. And John might just sit there and listen to you. And after a while, say, well, let me, let me tell you how things have been here in the prison. <laughs> let me tell you what I'm hearing, the rumbling, the rumors that they're partying over yonder. And um, I think somebody's plotting against me. So that's something we can get from, from John. First of all, obviously, you begin with his birth, that John's birth was unusual. We won't take time to read all that. In Luke chapter 1, you are introduced to his parents. His dad was a priest. What was his name? Zacharias. Of course, we've already said his mother's name was Elizabeth. And they were spring chickens, right? No, they were not. 
The Bible simply says they were both well advanced in years. That's Sophie. You say she's well advanced in years, all right? I am too, all right? Well advanced in years. You know, when you start getting notices about Medicare, you do know something, all right? That just tells you. And you get all these uh, texts and phone calls and all this, you know. You know, hey, well advanced in years. That was them. And then Luke also is very explicit to say that Elizabeth was barren that she had not been able all those years of their marriage to conceive. And yet, do you remember the story how that he is going about his priestly duties? And how many times had he done this? I don't know. But he's going through the motions, the procedures, and lo and behold, what? An angel appears. I didn't have one appear to me today. I don't know about you. All right, and here all of a sudden there's an angel. Now, this man, this old man, maybe, maybe his heart wasn't real strong, you know? And he is, there it is. And he is given news like Abraham was given, right? Very similar story. Abraham and Sarah were given a story that what? You're going to have a baby. You could put a lot of comedy into this story. I could just imagine this old guy, you know, getting about losing his balance and just, you know, had to get his composure. Remember the old guy on TV years ago, that, Esther, this is the big one? You know, that's, what? <laughs> Get a little bit late in life here. And so he's told that, but then he's also, uh, he's told, uh, name him a certain name. And of course, that was John. And then he says, well, you know, I'd like a little more information here. How is this going to happen? You know, give me more explanation. Well, just remember, dude, we, we do walk by faith and not by explanation, all right? And so the only thing now would be given to him was what? He suddenly was stricken to be mute. He couldn't talk. Zacharias couldn't talk. And he comes out of the temple there. And of course now he's gesturing and probably writing on pad. And lo and behold, we're told, you know what? That uh, lo and behold, Elizabeth's with child. And you know, just... You, you, you just can imagine, or not imagine, well, try to imagine, I guess. But you know, what was it like in the community? What was it like, you know? You know, usually like at church, you, I mean, I told Sophie, I thought we'd put a sentence in the Constitution of how many times the music director can show the picture of his grandson. What do y'all think? Don't y'all think we need to put a limit on that thing? Where is he? Where is he? That very he is. All right. Well, you know, you know, it's the buzz. And then when you're going to have a baby, can, can you just imagine what it was like when Abraham and Sarah and now Zacharias and Elizabeth start telling their senior adults, buddies, and friends, we're going to have a baby? They probably thought, well, he has literally fallen off of his rocker. But of course, that's what happens. That's what happens. And when the time comes, she has her baby, and, the, and so natural, so human, they come together, they're celebrating, and they start to name the baby, and they're going to give it a name, and Zacharias gestures, no, no, got to name the baby John. And soon he got his voice back. And by the way, if you will read a lengthy portion of the latter part of chapter one, you read a great statement by Zacharias. He was a man of spiritual insight and he realized God was going to do something very special with his baby. But I just want to remind you on your paper, Jeremiah 1, because this, this sounds so similar to what uh, the Lord said of Jeremiah, because when you read what Daddy Zacharias says about his son, that there is a that there is a, a divine purpose, a very distinct purpose for his life. God has a plan for his life even before he's born. And that's what he said to the prophet Jeremiah. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, "Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you, I ordained you a prophet to the nations." And by the way, Psalm one thirty nine even goes to say that. Uh, before birth, God has your life already in a record. And that's wisdom like this world doesn't know, right? And so, first of all, this guy's birth, it was unusual. I mean, you just, you're hearing a baby cry at the house of Zacharias and Elizabeth. All right, let's, let's move on from that. John's lifestyle was unimpressive. Now, we just read of where the Lord spoke about those who wear soft clothing, you know, and they are in the king's house and they don't ever do anything hard work or anything. Well, that is not how John was. Matthew 3, 
on your paper. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And John himself was clothed in camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. A little bit weird, isn't it? Huh? A little bit different. First, his dwelling. Uh, MacArthur, I was reading his commentary on this passage, and he said, you know, he said, this is not right at Jerusalem. He said, this is like a day's journey, very likely from Jerusalem. He's at, he said, it's kind of, you know, why would you start there? Well, it's just like Jesus. Where was he born? Bethlehem, not in Judea. He wasn't born in Rome. You know, the Bible talks about how God's ways are so different that even his weakness and his foolishness exceeds the strength and the wisdom of man. And so here is this guy, his headquarters is not in a metropolis, but the wilderness. The Bible says over in Luke 180, the child grew and became strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his manifestation. He stayed there a good little while. That was his dwelling. Well, of course, we just read about his dress, but we know in the scriptures that this is the attire of prophets in the Old Testament. 2 Kings 1.8. So they answered him. They're giving information about somebody. A hairy man. That doesn't mean on the top of his head like some of you, all right? But this is talking about his attire. The English standard has he wore a garment of hair, wearing a leather belt around his waist, and he said, it is Elijah the Tishbite. So he, he re immediately recognized, when you describe what he's wearing, I know it is. That's the prophet, the prophet Elijah. In fact, over in Zechariah 13, 4, talking about false prophets and how they would not wear that attire. They would wear something different. So you see, it was a recognized wardrobe for the prophets very often. And then there, of course, his diet. Makes you real hungry, doesn't it? Just gets your appetite, your taste buds stirred up. Locusts and honey. Well, you know what? People do eat locusts. They deep fry them. Uh, Ricky Kellum, a while back he came to me, he said, preacher, he said, do you know, he saw, I don't know if it was on TV, YouTube, something, where they deep fried shrimp heads. There, he knows, he said, yeah. He was going to bring some to Wild Game back, but I don't, I think he chickened out or something. Other. But he deep fried them, I guess, get them to where they're a crunch. I've headed shrimp. I don't want shrimp head, all right? I just don't. I want the other part, all right? But he ate this. That was his, his diet. Interesting enough, under the law, this was kosher. This was approved in the list where God says, eat this, don't eat this. I got on your paper right here, Luke, Leviticus 11. These you may eat, the locust after its kind, the destroying locust after its kind, the cricket after its kind, and the grasshopper after its kind. And do you know in history, even up to the present day, I understand what, I got a quote there for you, we won't read it. But in parts of the Middle East where people would eat locusts, and sometimes it was also trying to reduce the, 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 the numbers because they, of course, are very uh, destructive to their, to their crops. And, and reading about that, the people would say, and they're high in protein. <laughs> so uh, I'll leave that to you, all right? Whether you eat or drink, do all to the glory of the Lord, the Bible says, all right? So if you want it, have at it, all right? Just uh, make sure you say your blessing. Didn't Paul say it's all sanctified by prayer? So you know, just be sure to be thankful when you say But I, this quote I gave you, the guy said, it really is not a bad thing to do. He said, the only problem is today they use so much pesticide or insecticide rather uh, where there are these swarms and it really is a serious problem. They talk like they'll come in and just devour a crop. But he said, the problem is they spray this insecticide now. So if you eat the locusts, you're very likely you can have some of the poison in there. So good reason not to eat them, right? So now, see, if you were thinking about it, now you've got a reason not to, okay? But, but this guy, again, a very colorful character, but yet he does not appear to have any interest in the approval of people, in what people think. Now, in just a moment, we'll be uh, where Herod 
is going to do this terrible thing. But the thing about Herod, in contrast to John the Baptist, Herod's life absolutely was dominated by what other people thought. He didn't want to kill John the Baptist. Why? The Bible says because he feared the people. And yet at the same time, he's going to approve for him to be put to death because he was concerned about what those at his party thought about him. I'm jumping ahead of you. But the point is that guy's life was constantly dominated by what others think. Well, that happens today, doesn't it? Whether it's a teenager or an adult, our lives can be lived by what do they think? Do they agree? Do they approve? You know, our, our society is so uh, appearance-oriented like, you know, at school sometimes there'll be the issues of wardrobe, what you wear. I think it'd be great, honestly, because I'm, you know, 64 now, but I think it'd be great if they all wore a uniform. And there'd never be a, there'd never be a debate anymore about who's, wearing, who's most preppy, you know, and, and who has the approval of their peers. But that was what Herod was. He just wanted to, do they like me? Do they approve me? John the Baptist doesn't seem to have one lick of care about that, about what people thought about him. And we'll see at the very end why I said that. Okay? All right. Number three, his commitment. Here, here, here is what we were trying to get to, all right? And that, that is his faithfulness, his devotion. Now, he had no way of knowing how long his ministry would be, but I think he had every reason to think it would be brief because his assignment was basically one thing. What was that? To announce yeah, the arrival of the Messiah. And remember, he's baptizing people. He looks up on the bank. Remember? What did he say? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Remember that? I mean, that, that was his, basically his, now he preached up till then and, and a little more after that, but that's pretty much the sun is setting upon the arrival of Jesus. And yet for that period of time where it's, it's almost like the great tribulation. Now, of course, the tribulation is seven years and it thinks that John's ministry might've been six years, but it's very similar in that it is very intense. The, the pressure is on him. Would you turn to John chapter 3? First of all, there is a, there's, a, there's a principle about this guy's life for which he would not flinch. He wouldn't bend. He, he, he wouldn't capitulate. He, he just would not compromise. John chapter 3. I love this passage about John. This, this is so different from how too often even pastors can be because very often in ministry there's a ministerial jealousy and rivalry and that is wrong, that is absolutely wrong. And John was not afflicted with it. He, he, he was not jealous of another ministry. And so in John 3, verse 22, after these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. Now, John also was baptizing in Enon near Salem because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. For John had not yet been thrown into prison. Isn't that a way to put it, thrown into prison? Probably very likely that might have been literally the case. Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification because under the law they had these ceremonial washings, okay? And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. Boy, can't you hear it? That green-eyed monster is raising its head, all right? John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, I'm not the Messiah, but I have been sent before him. He knew his place. He knew his assignment and he was content there. That's where over in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, Paul talks about the body of Christ, the church, and that God has placed us in the body where it pleased him. Well, then why doesn't it please me? Why didn't it please us? If it pleases God, it should please us, right? Because it doesn't matter where we are in the body, we're there by grace. 
And so we should be happy. We should be thankful. We should be content. So he says, I've been sent before. I know my purpose. Verse 29, he who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. John, John had insight that others probably didn't even have, but here he's already, uh, in a sense, prophesying of the church, the believers being the bride of Christ. The bride of Christ, not the bride of John, the bride of Christ. And John says, you know, I, I kind of see myself like the best man. I'm, 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 I'm the, the groom's buddy. We, we, we've grown up together. We maybe went to school together. Or we did, did things together. And, and man, he, he asked me to be his best man at his wedding. And now there's the sweetheart of his life. They're getting married. And I am just so happy for my best friend. See, that's what John is saying. I am happy for people to come to Christ. It doesn't have to be through my preaching. It doesn't have to be through my ministry. I'm just happy for people to come to Christ. In fact, he said, my joy is what? It's full. I am full of joy here in this. Verse 30, he must increase, but I must decrease. See? John did not have a hang up with what others thought, but he also did not have a hang up even with himself. John said, I've learned something here. The way this thing works, the way up is down. The way to gain is to lose. That's what Jesus will teach, won't he? If any man comes after me, let him what? Take up his cross, follow me, deny himself. If you're willing to lose your life for my sake for the gospel, you'll find your life. But on the other hand, flip that thing around, you're going to lose. Okay? Verse 31, he who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. Oh, so you see the priority this guy had and he wouldn't even allow his associates, not his opposition now, but his associates, those disciples, because that's what he called them in those days, the followers, those that worked with them. He wouldn't even allow them to sway him, to seduce him. You know, try to kind of butter it up a little bit. No, no. His agenda was fixed. Christ must be first. It's kind of like Paul later in Philippians 1. What does he say in verse 21? For to me to live is Christ. It's Christ. Or he says to the churches of Galatia, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, nevertheless I live, yet not I but Christ. Good words to take in life. Not I but Christ. So his commitment is seen in his priority. Jesus and Jesus alone. Well, if you'll turn now to Mark, Mark 6. You see now something about his preaching and that his preaching was without compromise. Now we know that he came beginning his ministry uh, preaching repentance. When Jesus began his ministry, what did he preach? Repentance. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's what John preached. That's what Jesus preached. And interesting enough, on the day of Pentecost, when you have those folks responding to the preach of Peter and the others, and they said, what must we do? And remember, Peter said, repent. <laughs> repent. Revelations 2 and 3, Jesus is speaking to the churches. And what did he tell them to do? At the very end of the, after the seventh letter, he said, I stand at the door and knock as me as I love. I rebuke, be zealous therefore, and what? Repent. It's an echoing message down through the ages that God commands us to repent. Well, in Mark chapter six, we have a, an interesting, and this is also found in Matthew, but um, Mark six and verse 14, Jesus is out doing his ministry. And the word, you know, is waffling. Eventually it gets to King Herod. And when Herod hears, it's, a, it's Jesus that's the ministry now. John is now dead. But when Herod hears, gets this news of activity out there, 
his conscience just leaps to the surface. Look at uh, Mark 6 and verse 14. Now King Herod heard of him, this of Jesus, for his name had become well known. And he said, John the Baptist is risen from the dead, and therefore these powers are at work in him. Others said, it's Elijah. Others said, it's the prophet or like one of the prophets. But when Herod heard, he said, this is John. This guy's conscience is just eating his lunch. Say what you want to the others. He said, I know it is. It is John. He has come back to get me. He's come back to haunt me. This is John whom I beheaded. He has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had sent and laid hold of John, bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. Mm. Rather mixed up affair, isn't it? Because John had said to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. It's true, he started out in the wilderness, but he, he got his way down eventually to Jerusalem. And he has his encounters with Herod. And apparently, it's like when Nathan went to David, do you remember? When Nathan the prophet went to David after Bathsheba, the death of Uriah, and all, remember? And you remember how Nathan gave a parable of a man who had one little lamb and the story of how another came and took it and uh, David got riled up and he said, whoever did that, I'll tell you what, we'll get him. And Nathan said what? That's you. You're the man. And that's what John does here. John, I mean, think of the, the, the courage this is going to take. Now, he is speaking to Herod and Herod has a measure of authority. And besides that, he's a nut, all right? He's crazy. And so he's speaking to him. And it's therefore... Herodias held it against him. <laughs> she held it against John because he was calling out their sin of adultery and wanted to kill him, but she could not. Kind of like you know, Jezebel, Elijah, remember? Jezebel basically sent out the words, if I can get a hold of him, he's going to be dead. Of course, that's when Elijah ran, remember? You remember back in the first grade, see Elijah run, see Elijah run, remember that? That's what happened there. Well, so, but what happens here? In verse 24, Herod feared John. I just told you, he was more concerned about the opinions of people. Knowing that he was a just and holy man and he protected him. That's a real weird thing, isn't it? He recognized here's a, here's a man of distinction, a man of piety, a man of, apparently of holiness. And yet he approves him to be arrested and put, put in jail. But yet he, he won't let him kill him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. Then an opportune day came when Herod on his birthday gave a feast for his nobles, the high offices, officers and the chief men of Galilee. And when Herodias' daughter herself came in and danced and pleased Herod and those who sat with him, the king said to the girl, ask me whatever you want and I will give it to you. He also swore to her. That's like he took an oath. I, you know, promising you this. Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half my kingdom. This, the picture there is quite obvious. It's, it's a very seductive matter here, and he gets so worked up in the flesh that he says, I'll give you whatever you want. I'll, I'll let you have co-reign in my kingdom. I'll give you half the kingdom. To show you how wretched, how depraved the heart is. Verse 24, she went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. Her daughter could have been made wealthy in a moment. Think about it. She, she, she could have, as we would say, she could have been set for life if Herod followed through on what he said. And you have every reason to think he did because he, apparently did, he did things that pleased people. So she comes back and tells her what? They want. She came with haste in verse 25 and asked, saying, I want you to give me the, at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Verse 26, he's exceedingly sorry, yet because of the oaths and because of those who sat with him, 
He did not want to refuse her. Didn't want to be different. Didn't want to stand out. Isn't that very human nature? Can sometimes get people in trouble because I don't want to be different. I don't want to be recognized. I want, you know, I want people to like me. And this man, John the Baptist, will be taken from his prison cell and they will sever his head from his body and bring out that bloody head and give it to that girl. That's horrible. It's gruesome. That's what John the Baptist paid. His followers came and got his body, the remainder of the body, from neck down and took and buried it. But here is a man who was faithful unto death. He would not renounce. He would not change. He would not compromise. He stayed true. He could say what Paul would later say from a prison. I have kept the faith. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. And it cost me his life. But, interesting enough, if you'll turn, well, it's, oh, no, it's right there on your paper. I, I printed it for you. That is not the last word on John the Baptist. In John chapter 10, now John is dead. And Jesus is ministering. And it says in uh, on your paper, John 10, verse 40, he, Jesus, went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was baptizing at first, and there he stayed. Then many came to him and said, John performed no signs, or you may have in your Bible, miracles. Well, there, there's, a, there's a fraction of people today who would say, well, apparently, you know, he didn't, he didn't have enough faith or he, he didn't have the Holy Spirit or something or other. John did no miracle. Look what he said, though. But all the things that John spoke about this man were true. Were true. Jesus, in an earlier chapter of John, talked about how that the Father is glorified when men honor the Son. And John the Baptist honored the Son. We've often, we, you know the illustration, it's very obvious. People speak well about your son or daughter, man, it makes you feel good. Yeah, it does, it just makes you feel good. How much more the Heavenly Father? All that he said was true. Now note, and many believed in him there. Boy, when I read that, I, I thought of what the Bible says about Abel in, in Hebrews 11, that though he's dead, yet he continues to speak. And I thought about what Paul said to, to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1. He says, uh, I call to remembrance. He says, not only the authentic, genuine, unfeigned faith in you, he says, but faith that dwelt first in your grandmama. Apparently Paul knew Grandma Lois and Mama Eunice. He said, I, I remember those people. I remember those two women. I remember their faith. You see, you've got a witness that should outlive you. You've got a witness that God may use to touch somebody you never actually got to know firsthand that it will filter down, ripple down, even after you're dead and gone. Sophie and I went Sunday to a church in Raleigh. I was there last Monday for a funeral. And I said, you know, I want to go back. So we went, went back this past Sunday. And by the way, if anybody here thinks we're being strict on this stuff, <laughs> we don't come close. <laughs> you get there, you wear a mask and you don't go in, all right? Everybody in that church had a mask on. They had markings on the pews. They had a six-foot span there on tape. Don't sit there, you see. And so the person in front of you could sit over here, you see. And then that person over there, sit, it was staggered, you know. I mean, they, they had it right. I mean, they had it very well organized. I told somebody, I said, they'd run me off, all right? <laughs> but the, uh, the preacher, he's also... Uh, an instructor, a professor at Southeastern. And he, was telling, he, he told his message, he, he said just recently he had talked to one of his students of years ago. He's been there 25 years. And he said, they saw each other. And he said, Dr. Mosley, I want to tell you, you said something to me one day in class and it meant so much to me. 
Of course, Dr. Mosley, I don't have a clue, you know, what it was. But the point he was making, you know, for good or for ill, we have influence on people more than we appreciate. The world could have cared less about John the Baptist. This extremist, this fanatic, this oddball, and yet he was a man of integrity and people gave witness to that. He spoke the truth about Jesus. And John's ministry, though in his presence was only just a few short years, it lingered on. It, we're told here, people believed in Jesus there and you cannot disconnect this. There's a connection here of where they said, you know, John spoke to us about you and he was correct. And it's kind of like, it's like in John 4, the woman at the well, remember? And how she goes back to town and then the folks come and said, well, we first believed of what she said. Now we're believing because we see you for ourselves." And that's what you have here. These people were impressed by the, by the witness of John. And when they met Jesus, they believed in him. Just because we die does not mean God is not through with our witness. It can still linger on. In fact, I like over in Hebrews 11 where it says of Old Testament saints, they died in faith. Let's die in faith, folks. So we're to live by faith. We're to walk by faith. Let's die in faith. God might use your witness one day to a, a grandchild or a great-grandchild you never even knew. To a neighbor's child. To somebody that you didn't really get to know that well, but they get the news. And God uses that. See, John was faithful unto death, but he was also fruitful after death. Isn't that amazing? We don't, fruit trees don't tend to bear when they're dead. But John was dead and he was still having fruit. John had a very important role in the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of this world, they wouldn't give five cents for that guy. But the Lord approved. And friend, very soon we're going to stand before the Lord. And Jerry Falwell Sr. very often used to at the end of a message would say, let us do today that which we'll be glad we did on that day we stand before the Lord. Wow. If we just live every day like that. Let's do today that which we'll be glad we did on that day that we stand before the Lord. Well, I hope that helps. Before we uh, pray, we just ask to remember uh, Brother Jimmy in prayer. I understand he's got some blood clots in his leg. I just found that out a while ago. So if you remember Brother Jimmy, uh, Hobbs in your prayers, please. Alban Otis had hip uh, replacement surgery yesterday. It went well. He's home. Very grateful for that. He said, if y'all saw the email, he said he's going to try to milk it for all it's worth. But he said he thinks that Elizabeth's already got that thing figured out. All right. So I sent back, I sent back an email. I said, tough love, Elizabeth, tough love. All right. But he's very great. Appreciate your prayers. Anything else? Rhonda. John Miller family. Okay. Dr. John Miller family. Yes, ma'am. Okay, all right. Charlie? For who? If you must. Oh, okay, okay. Go on with it, girl. All right. Carol? You are? Carol is going to the hospital tomorrow for a treatment on her back. Okay? That's it. Election, please, please vote, but also pray, pray, pray. I urge you to pray. Okay. All right. 
Let's pray then now, okay? Our Father, we thank you for the forebears of the faith. The writer of Hebrews says we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. I thank you, Lord, for the unique individual we know as John the Baptizer. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you did through that very plain man. Lord, may we be more like him and that our concern is your priority, you being first. May we stop trying to impress others and instead, dear Lord, seek to honor you and obey you, do your will. And may we find joy, dear Lord, in people coming to Christ, however, whatever ministry it might be, if it's here through Tar Landing or if it's somewhere else, Lord, when people get saved, may it bless us and cause us to rejoice, dear Lord, because we love Jesus. He is our best friend. And our delight is people coming to know him. It's not about advancing ourselves or advancing this congregation. But Lord, it's all about the advancement of your kingdom and, your, and the king. So thank you. And again, Lord, as Stephen, now John, as they express to us, may we, Lord, strive more and more and more to indeed be found faithful as a good steward, faithful unto death. In Jesus, your name, we pray, remembering, dear Lord, these things now that have been expressed, Carol for her procedure tomorrow, Charlene Ken for traveling mercy, Alban for healing, for the Miller family and their grief, Father, for our nation. Oh, Lord, we admit, Lord, we, we don't deserve anything good. We deserve a lot of bad. But, Lord, if you would please, in your mercy, withhold from us what we deserve. And in your grace, Lord, give us what we don't deserve. Give us the leaders that we need. Give us people of character, of integrity. Father, I pray. Bless, I pray now as we go from here, maybe there's one here tonight, a heart that is hurting, a home that is hurting. You are the great physician. I pray you will heal. Bless that mom and stepdad who need healing tonight, Lord. Oh, Father, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. We hope you've enjoyed today's message. If you'd like to connect to us, you can reach us online at tarlandingbaptist.org. There you can find helpful links such as social media, additional sermons, email addresses for pastoral staff, as well as mailing addresses and telephone numbers. Thank you for watching.